A common question many people ask about Mars One is how they will decide which of their crews will actually fly on the first mission. So to elaborate on this, the head of Mars One's Crew Selection Committee, Dr Norma Kraft, released further details this past month as to how this process will actually be carried out. Now as you'll be aware, there are currently 100 candidates around the world that will be whittled down eventually to 24 next September. These selected candidates, comprising six teams of four people, each consisting of two women and two men, will then enter full-time training. The majority of the time of these selected candidates will be spent in a facility operated by Mars One, where they will train and study for the mission ahead. Now, as it is a full-time commitment, the families of the selected candidates will also be permitted to join them and move to the facility. Each year of the training will be divided into two parts. Firstly, nine months each year will be devoted to knowledge and skill acquisition as well as their practice, with a few of the areas requiring familiarity, for instance, being medicine, dentistry, engineering, electronics, astrobiology, geology, political science, the list goes on and on. But also a key component of this part of the training will be ensuring that each team spends time in the home countries of each of its team members in order to foster familiarity with all of the cultures represented within each crew. And secondly, three months each year will be devoted to inter-team challenges in order to enable each team to demonstrate what they'd actually learned during the previous nine months and put it into practice. Now it's important to stress that these challenges are not strictly competitive in nature. Indeed, some of the challenges will be collaborative endeavours where one team will work together with another team in order to solve a mutual problem. The reason for having these kind of challenges is because eventually you would expect that an additional crew would land on Mars, join with the first crew, and from that point onwards they have to be able to work together. And so this is encouraged very early on in the training programme. So we have these challenges that are going on continually assessing the teams. Basically, the ultimate goal of these challenges is to assess each team's ability to reason creatively and to come up with ways to solve problems in the face of extreme adversity. The teams will also be assessed on their preferred organisational structure's effectiveness and on the overall dynamic of their team. During this process, each team will have a dedicated trainer who will work with them to prepare them for the challenges. And if at the end of the day it's found that a team is unsuitable and does not perform satisfactorily in the challenges, then that team may be eliminated from the training process. Now of course there will always be at least six teams training at any one time for the mission to enable redundancy in team selection, so you can always replace team members with a new team coming in from a subsequent selection process that Mars One opens up on a periodic basis once every few years or so. Because you have to remember that ultimately unsuitable teams will not be permitted to train for the Mars mission. And this is particularly important for selecting the team for the first mission because the success or failure of their mission has wide reaching ramifications for the entire program itself. So how is the performance of each team assessed at the end of each year? Well, each team will receive a score from five contributing factors. Firstly, a score based on how the team actually performed in each of the key aspects of the challenge, and so which team was judged to have won each part of the challenge. Next up, there will be three contributing scores from three judges which each have specialist technical expertise in the areas the challenges were designed to assess. And finally, there will be a contributing factor from the public. Now, it's important to emphasize here that the role of the public is primarily to serve as a tiebreaker in the case of two roughly equally performing but low performing teams in order to decide which of them should potentially be in the line for elimination from the process. But again, under no circumstance will a team that performed well in the challenges and objectively satisfied the expert judges be able to be just voted off by the public. That's not going to happen. Ultimately, Mars One feels quite strongly that it's important to engage and involve the public in the team training process, but in no way is this a popularity contest. But speaking of popular figures, I'm pleased to say that we now have an air date 
for the Mars One episode of Neil deGrasse Tyson's Star Talk TV show over on the National Geographic channel. You'll be able to catch Mars One CEO and myself discussing the mission with Dr. Tyson on December 13th, but in the meantime, I'll post a short clip from the episode down below. Actually, speaking of down below, I'll also throw in a recent interview with two of the Australian Mars One candidates, which you can check out down in the description. For this month's public outreach and education highlight, I'd like to give a shout out to Canadian Mars One candidate Karen Cumming. Karen has been travelling around Ontario this past month, giving talks about Mars One, particularly in a Polytechnic Institute and more recently in a public library. Great work, Karen. And, you know, now that I think about it, Canada seems to have an insatiable drive and desire to learn about space, because it's probably the country that I receive the most requests and interest from to Skype into schools. And incidentally, if you do know any schools that might be interested in speaking to a Mars One candidate about the mission and potentially about career opportunities in science and technology, then by all means, feel free to drop me a message down below and I'll be happy to arrange it. Finally, I just wanted to briefly discuss an interesting post from Mars One CEO they published on LinkedIn this past month. Basically, what it boils down to is an analysis of a very interesting choice of words that featured prominently in NASA's latest report on their Journey to Mars initiatives framework. So if we examine the report, incidentally, I'll post the full report down below for you. But if you look in the introduction, then right at the beginning, it clearly states, like the Apollo program, we embark on this journey for all humanity. Unlike Apollo, and here's the key, we will be going to stay. It then goes on to say at the end of the introduction, we are developing the capabilities necessary to get there, land there, and live there. It's worth emphasizing here that NASA have not changed tactic to favor one-way trips to Mars over traditional human return missions. Indeed, the report itself still focuses on human Martian surface return missions in the admittedly somewhat vague 2030s plus timeframe. But what is significant is that they've now elevated the notion of long-term human settlement of Mars from an abstract distant future concept to the primary reason why NASA wants to send humans to Mars. Indeed, if NASA had had this long-term focus and approach back in, say, the days of the Apollo program, maybe we would have had the lunar colonies that many people predicted by the year 2000, instead of the rush to plant a flag approach that we had. So by taking this approach, NASA seems to have aligned more closely with what we've been seeing increasingly recently, such as the announcement of the joint ESA Roscosmos initiative that is championing an international moon base as the eventual successor to the International Space Station, and of course the Chinese space program with their long-term lunar ambitions eventually into a lunar outpost, solar energy generation and resource extraction, which is a very ambitious program to say the least. So I'm very curious now to hear your thoughts about this. What do you think about NASA's almost careful changing of their wording to really focus on human settlement and not just visits? And also, what do you think about how tr traditional governmental initiatives and space programs can fit into this increasingly privatized space sector that we're seeing with all these new entries like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, etc. And I'm sure many more in subsequent years. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts, so put them down in the comments below. Thanks for watching. If you're new to this channel, I produce monthly updates on the Mars One project on the first Saturday of each month, as well as far-ranging content on planetary science, astrophysics, and human spaceflight. This month's feature video is the daring and successful first stage landing by Blue Origin on November 23rd, which I suspect SpaceX may be about to outdo with an orbital landing. Next time, I'll be examining the mysterious origin of life here on Earth. But in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter, subscribe, and comment down below to join the conversation.